The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Selective Inhibition of Oncogenic Transcription and Other Novel Approaches in the Treatment of Small Cell Lung Cancer, an illustrative guide to navigating the evolving treatment landscape and integrating latest treatment modalities into clinical care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash JCF860. Downloadable infographics are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now, on to today's podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Jacob Sands from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to this PeerView In Motion activity focused on recent advances and new therapeutic options in small cell lung cancer. In this educational program, we will use dynamic infographic visualization and animations to learn about the evolving treatment landscape for this challenging subtype of lung cancer, the mechanisms of action, and efficacy safety profiles of the current and emerging agents, and implications for clinical practice. First, in looking at the outline, we'll review a bit of historical perspective. When looking at outcomes in small cell lung cancer, this is an aggressive, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. It accounts for about 13 to 15 percent of all lung cancers. The vast majority of small cell lung cancers are associated with a significant smoking history and smoke exposure. Rarely, this can occur in those with a very limited or never smoking history, and those are considered outliers, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Small cell lung cancer tends to present with bulky mediastinal lymph node involvement, and there's often metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. Until recently, there had been very limited progress in management of small cell lung cancer with few advances and poor outcomes. When looking at historical perspective for small cell lung cancer, the survival curves have been daunting. And the curves have often looked like what one of my attendings in fellowship would say from the back of the room, that that curve is not skiable, to represent the fact that there's a rapid drop-off. Unfortunately, small cell lung cancer curves have looked that way, and we now have some recent advances that we'll be discussing as part of this presentation. Looking back at topotecan, which until recently was the only second-line approved option, We see a survival curve of this relative to best supportive care. And when you see a survival curve where the control arm is best supportive care, that really highlights the fact that there have been limited options. Although we see separation of these curves, it is not as dramatic as we would hope for when looking at a control arm of best supportive care. When we focus on small cell lung cancer diagnosis, this, like all solid tumors, are diagnosed by pathology from biopsy. We look at the standard immunohistochemical markers for lung neuroendocrine, the majority express TTF1, and 75% express neuroendocrine differentiation. These include synaptophysin, chromogranin, and or CD56. Small cell lung cancer also has a high mitotic rate and is a transcriptionally active cancer. This leads to rapid disease progression. When looking at small cell lung cancer staging, we discuss staging a little bit different than in non-small cell lung cancer, particularly a separation of limited stage versus extensive stage disease. Limited stage disease can be treated with chemotherapy and radiation, This is disease limited to an area that is encompassable by a radiation field. There is also TNM staging, which is more precise, but the Veterans Administration Lung Study Group of limited versus extensive stage is often still used clinically. Further subclassification by stage rarely impacts management. There have been barriers to treatment advances in small cell lung cancer that are worth noting. 
There are numerous challenges to drug development in small cell lung cancer. This is a smoking-related cancer, and as such, often patients have significant comorbidities that can impact their outcomes. Small cell lung cancer leads to rapid progression of disease, and as such, there is limited time for initiation of next-line therapy, which can particularly present complications and challenges when trying to enroll to clinical trials, as it prevents an opportunity for delays in treatment with trial screening and necessary workup prior to initiation of therapy on a clinical trial. Standard chemotherapy is easy to administer, and there are some options that are available. Given this and the desire to rapidly initiate therapy, this may lead to decreased referrals to centers with more clinical trials options. Given the rapid progression of small cell lung cancer, the time necessary to obtain biopsies before a next-line therapy is challenging. At the same time, when biopsies are obtained, there can be necrosis that limits the amount of usable tumor specimen. This has led to fewer preclinical models that are necessary for further drug development. This has led to dozens of failed randomized trials. Despite impressive initial responses to first-line chemotherapy, there have been countless novel strategies that have failed to extend patient survival, particularly in the second line and beyond. Looking at the genomic alterations in small cell lung cancer, we see that there are many somatic mutations present within the tumor specimens. And when we look across all tumor types, small cell lung cancer tends to be the one with a greater amount of somatic mutation prevalence. This is likely due in part to the significant smoking history without any particular driver mutation that's present. Small cell lung cancer is extremely rare in individuals without a smoking history. It's important to point out that in somebody who never smoked, molecular profiling may help clarify the diagnosis and demonstrate a target. These likely represent outliers within small cell lung cancer. The vast majority of patients do have a significant smoking history. A discussion of the common genomic alterations in small cell lung cancer helps us to better understand this challenging disease. P53 mutations, RB1 loss, and MYC amplification are all very common. Better understanding these three genes helps us to better understand the disease itself. P53 is often called a guardian of the genome. This activates DNA repair proteins, arrests cell cycles to allow for DNA repair when there are multiple alterations present. This can also initiate apoptosis in cells with significant DNA damage that is not being adequately repaired. Mutations of p53 impact cellular response to DNA damage. Mutations in p53 are present in the majority of small cell lung cancers. RB1 loss is almost always noted in small cell lung cancer as well. RB1 inhibits cell cycle progression by binding transcription factors in cells with damaged DNA, arresting replication in S phase. In a sense, P53 and RB1 are both like breaks for the cells that are moving forward with significant genomic alterations. By hitting the brakes, it allows the cells time to repair the DNA before completing replication. When those brakes are broken with mutations and loss of function, it prevents those cells from halting replication to allow for repair. At the same time, MYC is amplified in about 20% of small cell lung cancers. MYC proteins activate expression of genes that enable proliferation. In this sense, MYC amplification is like pushing the gas pedal to drive faster through replication. This means that the majority of small cell lung cancers have broken breaks preventing the cells from stopping replication despite multiple genomic alterations. And many of them also have MYC amplification further pushing the cells into replication, which leads to more active progression of disease. Looking at the current treatment landscape in extensive stage small cell lung cancer, we have the new standard of care of first-line systemic therapy being chemotherapy plus atezolizumab or chemotherapy plus dervalumab. Empower 133 
was a study of carboplatin and etoposide with either atezolizumab or placebo. In the initial presentation, the study noted a median progression-free survival benefit of about one month, which was statistically significant. The median overall survival benefit was about two months, which was also statistically significant. Although these median improvements are modest, the real benefit was noted in the durability of responses further out to the right side of the curve, with a significant improvement at the 12-month time frame. It's important to acknowledge with these checkpoint inhibitors that although we don't see dramatic responses in everybody, there appear to be a subset of patients that experience substantial improvement over just the carboplatin plus etoposide. And the right side of these survival curves is where we really see those benefits. Caspian was a similar trial with some notable differences. This trial included platinum etoposide in the control arm and platinum etoposide plus dervalumab in the experimental arm. This was not placebo controlled and as such allowed the investigators to choose either four or six cycles as their control arm duration. In the experimental arm, it was platinum etoposide plus dervalumab. And we saw very similar results in this trial as to Empower 133. This trial did have a significant median overall survival advantage, but again, it was a modest difference in the median overall survival. Similar to Empower 133, the right side of the curve, being the durable responses, are what was most compelling. A recent update of the overall survival at two years showed 14% in the control arm and 22% in the dervalumab plus platinum etoposide arm. So now that we're in the immunotherapy era, when patients have progressed on platinum etoposide plus a checkpoint inhibitor, what are the next best options? The challenge becomes subsequent treatment options. And a look at NCCN guidelines gives us an array of treatment options. An important point in considering next-line options is first of all an understanding of chemotherapy-free interval. This is the time frame since the last completed first-line chemotherapy. In this case, platinum etoposide, the time when that treatment is ended starts the clock in looking at the chemotherapy-free interval. When the chemotherapy-free interval has gone beyond six months, retreatment with platinum etoposide becomes an option. Topotecan has been an FDA-approved option with a chemotherapy-free interval beyond 45 or 60 days, depending on PO or IV. Lurbanectidin is a recently approved second-line therapy without limitations in the chemotherapy-free interval. First, a look at Topotecan, which has carried an FDA approval for years. Topotecan is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor that prevents re-ligation of the cleaved DNA strand, leading to DNA damage and cell death. Topotecan can be given PO or IV. When given PO, the treatment is 2.3 milligrams per meter squared per day for days 1 to 5 every 21 days. This is approved for those with a chemotherapy-free interval of at least 45 days after first-line therapy. Topotecan can also be given IV at 1.5 milligrams per meter squared per day for days 1 to 5 every 21 days. This approval is for a chemotherapy-free interval of at least 60 days. The efficacy of these two different dosing regimens was in two different trials. The Topotecan PO was versus best supportive care. The Topotecan IV was compared to chemotherapy with CAV, which has been a regimen studied and utilized within small cell lung cancer for many years. The toxicity profile of the two methods of dosing is similar. In both cases, significant cytopenias are noted, and these often result in a need for dose reduction. In both forms, we do see some significant nausea noted. In the PO form, significant diarrhea has been experienced. Fatigue is another common adverse event 
within both dosing regimens. A new FDA-approved option for second-line small cell lung cancer without limitations in the chemotherapy-free interval is lurbanectidin. Lurbanectidin is a synthetically produced agent that was originally derived from sea squirt. Lurbanectidin is a selective inhibitor of oncogenic transcription. We previously discussed that small cell lung cancer often has genomic alterations that lead to rapid cell proliferation. With p53 mutation and RB1 loss, the cells have essentially lost the breaks that prevent ongoing replication with multiple mutations in the cell. We also discussed that MYC amplification is common. In cells with these alterations, it is as if the breaks to replication are broken, and cells with multiple mutations and other alterations are pushed forward with the gas pedal of MYC amplification, increasing replication of cells with multiple genomic alterations. Lurbanectidin binds to DNA gene promoters, preventing binding of transcription factors. This inhibits oncogenic transcription, leading to cell apoptosis. Lurbanectidin also induces apoptosis of monocytes and tumor-associated macrophages in the tumor microenvironment. Lurbanectidin inhibits cell migration and limits production of inflammatory mediators such as CCL2 and CXCL8, as well as angiogenic factors such as VEGF. Tumor-associated macrophages have demonstrated actions that can lead to tumor proliferation and growth, such as increasing angiogenesis, suppressing the immune system locally to the tumor, and increasing matrix remodeling. By inducing apoptosis of tumor-associated macrophages, this results in stopping these tumor proliferation measures. The FDA approval for lurbanectidin comes from a basket study reported by Trigo et al. This was a single-arm phase 2 study in second-line small cell lung cancer. In this study, sensitive disease was defined as those with a chemotherapy-free interval of greater than or equal to 90 days. Resistant disease was therefore defined with a chemotherapy-free interval less than 90 days. Amongst all patients, 35% experienced a partial response, while 33% experienced stable disease. As expected, there was a difference noted between the sensitive and resistance disease groups. In those with resistant disease, partial response was 22%. In those with sensitive disease, partial response was 45%. The median duration of response amongst all patients was 5.3 months, with 43% still responding at 6 months. Again, a difference was noted in those with resistant disease and sensitive disease in the category of response at 6 months. The difference was 12% versus 55%. 12-month overall survival in this challenging clinical scenario was 15.9% in those with resistant disease, and 48.3% in those with platinum-sensitive disease. These results described are also visualized in the survival curves, looking at sensitive disease with a median duration of response of 6.2 months, and in resistant disease with a median duration of response of 4.7 months. This swimmer's plot also demonstrates the duration of response for some patients ongoing out beyond 8 to even 12 months. Important to note that even among patients with resistant disease, there were some ongoing responses out to many months. A look at the safety profile of lurbanectidin demonstrates that this is generally well tolerated. Cytopenias were noted, especially neutropenia, with 21% grade 3 and 25% grade 4. Although significant neutropenia was noted, febrile neutropenia was uncommon, with only 2% grade 3 and 3% grade 4. Important to this topic is to highlight that patients were not allowed to get primary prophylaxis within the study. 
Some patients did end up getting GCSF with future cycles, although as noted, this was not allowed at the start of the trial. Now that we've discussed an FDA-approved option, we're going to discuss a few that are commonly used off-label. Arinotecan is another topoisomerase inhibitor that prevents re-ligation of the cleaved DNA strand, leading to DNA damage and cell death. The data for arinotecan comes from a small number of patients, but has demonstrated efficacy. Looking at a study published in 1992 that included 15 patients, five of whom were initially diagnosed with limited stage disease and 10 initially diagnosed with extensive stage disease. The response rate in this small study was 47%, with seven patients experiencing a partial response. The median duration of response was 58 days with a median overall survival of 187 days. The toxicity profile of this drug is favorable. Cytopenias can be noted. Diarrhea is something to monitor. This is an option I have used for some patients in whom I'm concerned about any side effect profile. Paclitaxel is another that is commonly used off-label for small cell lung cancer. Paclitaxel was initially isolated from the Pacific yew tree. Paclitaxel binds to microtubules, promoting microtubule assembly and preventing disassembly. This inhibits cell replication by interfering with the late G2 mitotic phase. Paclitaxel has been studied in two different dosing schemes, one being 175 milligrams per meter squared IV every three weeks. In a small study of 21 patients, a partial response rate was noted of 29%. The median response duration was 108 days, the median progression-free survival being 65 days, and median overall survival of 100 days. These median outcomes highlight the challenge of this clinical scenario. Another way of dosing paclitaxel, which tends to be better from a side effect profile, is 80 milligrams per meter squared weekly times six weeks in an eight-week cycle. This was also studied in a small study of 21 patients. Amongst the 21 patients, the response rate of 24% was noted. When looking at data from small cell lung cancer, we've discussed the importance of the chemotherapy-free interval. In this study, there were 11 patients with sensitive disease and 10 that were considered refractory. Amongst the 11 with sensitive disease, the response rate was 27% and refractory was 20%. In the weekly dosing, the side effect profile was generally well tolerated. We see a limited number of grade 3 adverse events at this dosing, although cytopenias are noted. This is often an option for patients where you're concerned about the side effect profile of a next-line option for small cell lung cancer. Of course, anytime you're giving paclitaxel, one needs to consider neuropathy and monitor for this. Another option is temozolomide. Temozolomide is a prodrug that rapidly converts to an active metabolite that alkylates methylates DNA, damaging the DNA resulting in apoptosis. Temozolomide is most noted given the significant penetration of the blood-brain barrier. Temozolomide dosing can be done a couple of ways. First, we'll look at 75 mg per meter squared per day, days 1 to 28 of a 28-day cycle. The waterfall plot shows responses out to the right. We see multiple partial responses and one complete response noted. This study described platinum-sensitive disease as being a chemotherapy-free interval greater than two months. A label of refractory disease was designated for those with a chemotherapy-free interval less than or equal to two months. There were some patients with platinum refractory disease that did have a response to therapy with temozolomide. When giving temozolomide, it is important to remember to dose on Dancitron 30 minutes before. Temozolomide can cause nausea, and this pre-dosing with ondansetron can significantly reduce the development of nausea. 
When looking at the efficacy of temozolomide, we see a difference in the curves between those with platinum-sensitive and platinum-refractory disease. As expected, the curve drops off more quickly with platinum refractory. In looking at these curves, note the difference in the axis with time, making the shape alone not indicative of the full story on efficacy. Another way of dosing temozolomide is 200 mg per meter squared per day on days 1 to 5 of a 28-day cycle. This higher dosing over fewer days within the cycle has demonstrated some improvement in tolerability that we'll discuss. First, looking at the waterfall plot, we do see some responses to therapy, including those amongst some patients with platinum refractory disease. In this study, platinum refractory was considered those with a chemotherapy-free interval of less than 60 days. The side effect profile of the five-day dosing shows less cytopenias. When comparing these two dosing regimens, in general, it appears that the tolerability of the five-day dosing may be slightly better. At the same time, the efficacy between the trials appears to maybe be slightly better in the 21-day dosing. It is impossible to draw any true conclusions, as this is cross-trial comparison of two studies with some notable differences. In the 21-day dosing study, 75% of patients had platinum-sensitive disease, while in the 5-day dosing, only 64% of patients had platinum-sensitive disease. This certainly creates some challenges in comparing efficacy but is something to consider. It's important to note that patients who have received platinum atopicide plus atezolizumab or platinum atopicide plus dervalumab are not really good candidates for later line checkpoint inhibitor at progression. Many patients are now being treated with those checkpoint inhibitors in the frontline setting, making nivolumab or pembrolizumab not compelling options at the time of progression. In patients who have progressed on a checkpoint inhibitor, there is no evidence for any benefit of a later checkpoint inhibitor, with the exception of rare patient-specific scenarios. To summarize, small cell lung cancer is a transcriptionally active cancer that is highly resistant after progression on first-line therapy. Compelling second-line options have been lacking. Topotecan has served as an FDA-approved option for years. Lurbanectidin, a newly approved agent in this setting, is also now a new option. Second line and beyond small cell lung cancer is an area of ongoing research with multiple drugs in development. We have discussed some of the challenges of small cell lung cancer with a handful of FDA-approved treatment options, along with others that are commonly used off-label. Now let's put it all together. In the first-line setting, platinum atopicide plus atezolizumab or platinum atopicide plus dervalumab are the standard of care. If a patient is diagnosed with extensive stage small cell lung cancer, one of these treatment options is preferred. At progression after one of these regimens, we've discussed a handful of other options. So let's discuss some scenarios in which one may be preferential over another. First of all, generally speaking, at progression we have lurbanectidin as an FDA-approved option without limitation based on chemotherapy-free interval. Topotecan is an approved option in those with a chemotherapy-free interval of at least 45 days or 60 days based on PO or IV dosing. Generally speaking, lurbanectidin would be my approved second-line treatment option. In patients with a chemotherapy-free interval of greater than six months, retreatment with platinum atopicide is considered an option. Although this is an option, it is not my preference, particularly in patients with a chemotherapy-free interval close to six months. We know that the duration of response to retreatment with platinum atopicide is likely to be less than the initial response to therapy. 
In that sense, patients are less likely to get a significant amount of time after completing the chemotherapy. The discussion becomes particularly interesting in patients who were initially diagnosed with limited stage disease. In those patients, the standard of care treatment is platinum etoposide plus radiation with curative intent. At the time of progression, those patients have not been exposed to a checkpoint inhibitor. In those cases, checkpoint inhibitor becomes a consideration. When looking at checkpoint inhibitors, we note that a subset of patients experience a response. But amongst those who have that response, it is often durable. Due to the potential for durable responses, I want to make sure that each patient does get one of these checkpoint inhibitors at some point in their care. If a patient is rapidly clinically declining, we must acknowledge that checkpoint inhibitors are less likely to result in response to therapy. If the line of therapy at the time of rapid progression is not effective, those patients may lose an opportunity for any other treatment options. Whether somebody is treated for limited stage or extensive stage disease, prophylactic cranial irradiation is a consideration. In patients who have gotten whole brain radiation, whether that be from prophylactic or therapeutic intervention, if they have progression in the brain after that time, it can represent a very challenging clinical scenario. Re-irradiation to the brain can carry an increase in toxicity. Temozolomide in that scenario can be an option with good CNS penetration across the blood-brain barrier. Patients who have previously received radiation to the brain, now with progression in the brain, may benefit from temozolomide. We've discussed multiple treatment options after progression on first-line platinum etoposide plus checkpoint inhibitor. Although we've discussed these various treatment options more in the second-line setting after treatment with platinum etoposide plus a checkpoint inhibitor, that is not to say that these different drugs can't be used in later lines of therapy. When treating somebody with small cell lung cancer, we want to string along multiple therapies, hopefully getting some benefit from each of them. If we're able to successfully treat with multiple lines of therapy, this will hopefully further prolong a patient's quality of life. Treatments such as paclitaxel and arinotecan have both been discussed as drugs that are generally well tolerated from a side effect profile. When looking at cross-trial comparisons of these different drugs, lurbanectidin efficacy and tolerability performs well, which is what led to the FDA approval. Let's discuss some cases for further visualization. Mr. B, a 65-year-old man, presented with shortness of breath and cough that had progressed over months. A chest x-ray revealed a lung mass, and CT scan showed lung mass with mediastinal adenopathy and liver metastases. MRI brain showed no evidence of disease. Mr. B was treated in the first-line setting with carboplatin etoposide plus atezolizumab. After completion of four cycles of chemotherapy plus atezolizumab, he continued on maintenance atezolizumab for another eight months before CT scan showed new bone metastases and progression of other sites of disease. At this point, he has been treated on platinum etoposide with a chemotherapy-free interval of greater than six months and progressed on ongoing therapy of atezolizumab. Let's assume that he had gotten prophylactic cranial irradiation at the completion of his four cycles that included chemotherapy. MRI brain at the time of progression does not show any evidence of disease. Mr. B still has a reasonable functional status at ECOG-1. Treatment options that we can consider include retreatment with platinum etoposide given the duration of the chemotherapy-free interval. Topotecan has been an FDA-approved option, while lurbanectidin is a recently approved treatment option. In a patient like this, my preference would be lurbanectidin. Although the chemotherapy-free interval is greater than six months, 
the likelihood of him having the same amount of benefit from retreatment with platinum metoposide is low. Lorbenectidin has been generally well tolerated and in some patients demonstrated significant duration of response. If we are to change the clinical scenario a little bit and saying that at the time of progression, Mr. B has experienced multiple new brain metastases. We previously mentioned that he had gotten prophylactic cranial irradiation. In this setting, re-irradiation of the brain has added toxicity. One consideration for treatment would be temozolomide, which has good penetration into the CNS by crossing the blood-brain barrier. Temozolomide is a reasonable treatment option to hopefully also generate a CNS response. If we change the scenario a little bit and say that at the time of progression, it is after a chemotherapy-free interval of only one month. In that setting, the only FDA-approved option would be lurbanectidin. This is a very challenging clinical scenario with poor prognosis. This is a chemotherapy-free interval that does not allow for topotecan per the FDA approval, and retreatment with platinum atoposide is unlikely to provide any benefit. Now let's consider one other aspect. In a patient who has received platinum atoposide plus a checkpoint inhibitor in the first line with a chemotherapy-free interval of about six months, treated with lurbanectidin in the second line, and now looking at third-line options. We've discussed multiple drugs that are commonly used off-label, and one can choose from multiple options that we've already outlined. Some important things to consider from a side effect profile. In a patient with significant neuropathy, paclitaxel may not be a great treatment option as this can cause neuropathy. Similarly, arinotecan is a drug that can cause diarrhea. In a patient with significant GI issues, such as problems with diarrhea, arinotecan may not serve as the best option. Ultimately, patient-specific factors become very important to the determination of best treatment option at any given line. This ends our infographic educational activity focused on treatment advances in small cell lung cancer. I hope you have found the material presented here informative and useful to your practice. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash JCF 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.